You're listening to Alternative Investor Mastermind, where we do a deep dive on alternative investment opportunities and the lifestyle it can create. Join Jack Krupe as he presents actionable tips and tricks in doing passive real estate away from mainstream strategies. Go beyond the usual fix and flips and try less explored yet rewarding investing ventures from multifamily properties, mobile homes to cryptocurrencies. Do not miss this opportunity to escape traditional assets and finally create wealth without Wall Street. Now your host, Jack. No discussions in the podcast are meant as an offer to sell or a solicitation for an offer to buy any security. All investments should be done after careful review and consideration of the investment documents and disclosures. Contents discussed in the podcast are not meant to be construed as an investment, tax, or legal advice. Individuals should always consult his or her own professional advisors before any investment decision. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Alternative Investor Mastermind. Really excited today to have a friend of mine. We've been trying to coordinate this for a while. Uh, Sean King is here today. Sean, thanks for joining the show. Thank you, Jack. So I, I've been down here since 2018 and uh, met a lot of interesting people. Uh, we've uh, communicated more online. You post a lot of insightful stuff, and I really wanted to just uh, have you on to talk about your story, and uh, we're going to dive into a number of topics, including Bitcoin. But uh, first and foremost, uh, just tell us a little bit just about your, your background and uh, your path and how you got here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I was born in West Virginia. I moved to Tennessee when I was five years old, lived there from five till 47 when I moved to Puerto Rico. Um, my father was in insurance and financial services, and um, I kind of became enamored with that business as a teenager. He he uh, would win these reward conferences, and I think I was about 14, and he took me to one of these reward conferences, and I got to stay at this amazing hotel. Like I'd never seen anything like it. I'm like, wow, if you get to take trips like this, this is the business I want to be in. But he said, you know, if you want to come into this business, you know, I want you to go to law school, get a law degree, um, become a, uh, a CPA. Um, cause it'll really help you. And, you know, CPAs and lawyers are the ones who mess up most of my deals. So, um, so if you can do that, it'll, it'll really give you a leg up. So I, I was, crazy enough to take his advice, uh, went to law school, uh, became a CPA, and then ended up working in qualified retirement plan business, 401ks, 403bs for a number of years, doing both the administrative side. We had a TPA firm that would do the administration of the plans, and then we also would do the investment due diligence through various investment advisors. Um also got involved in the insurance side of the business, um, eventually some private wealth sort of uh, investment management, and grew those businesses. And um, yeah, and finally, I guess we, around the end of 2017, moved here to Puerto Rico, um, got involved with Bitcoin, which will be another story uh, quite early. And so, yeah, lots of other things I could talk about, but that's the highlights. That that uh, that's great. And how did you find uh, Puerto Rico initially? As far as the, you know, imagine tax had something to do with it, but we all had our own, you know, random ways of finding it. Yeah. So we had visited Puerto Rico, gosh, probably a half a dozen times for spring breaks, on cruises. We would stop in Puerto Rico, and uh, we would vacation here, and just loved it. Absolutely loved Puerto Rico. Loved the island. Loved the people. And then in, I guess, two thousand and twelve or thirteen. I was receiving Peter Schiff's, one of his newsletters, and uh, he had just recently moved to the island. Peter's crazy. He's wrong about Bitcoin. He's right about some things, wrong about Bitcoin. Um, but I'd read his newsletter, and that sort of got me interested in the tax uh, possibilities. I had been a holder of uh, Bitcoin by that point, and I was absolutely convinced that it was going to just keep going up and up and up. And so um, summer of 2014, my family came down here and spent the summer it's kind of a test run to just see if we enjoyed living here, if we could really, if I could work effectively from here, do business. We loved it so much so that my wife basically had a, a breakdown the day before we were supposed to go back to, uh, to Tennessee. She didn't want to leave Puerto Rico. Uh, but the timing wasn't right to move. So we went back to Tennessee. Um, three years later, the, the next crypto boom had happened. Uh, the kids were the right age to make a move, and very end of 2017, we um, we moved to Puerto Rico and and pursued the the tax incentives. That, that's great. So, how and how did you first discover? Do you do you remember like the first time you heard of Bitcoin? 
Yeah, the first time I heard of it was actually a different investment newsletter um, by the guy that does Elliott Wave Theorist. What's his name? Um, oh, I'm embarrassed. Uh, he, yeah, I'm blanking too. He's published a, a famous investment newsletter for decades called Elliott Wave Theorist. He's out of Gainesville, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. Um, and I was receiving his newsletter and he mentioned it. This had to be probably 2010 or maybe early 2011. So just within a year or so after Bitcoin, within two years after Bitcoin going live, uh, I read about it and I was crazy enough to like become intrigued by it. I instantly went down the, the infamous Bitcoin rabbit hole, spent days, weeks, months obsessing over the concept and the possibility of the concept. and. Um, scrambled around and eventually found a way to throw a few thousand dollars and acquire some. It was really hard to do back then. You had to jump through all these hoops to send money to different places and then hope that the person you're sending money to actually would send you Bitcoin. There weren't really weren't any, any established uh, decent exchanges back then. Uh, but it all worked out. I ended up buying my first coins or some of my first coins through Charlie Shrem's, um, company bit instant was what it was called back then which was one of the early sort wow. of uh, brokers for bitcoin so this was before even like like mount gox or yeah uh, this would have been early 2011 gox m may have been around then but um but if it was i didn't know about it yeah, I did meet some uh, one person at a conference that uh, was trying to buy ecstasy and got on silk road <laughs> and that's how they discovered bitcoin <laughs> And they're multimillionaires now and do real estate uh, syndications, but uh, yes, yes. that's uh, the, the alternative way of, of uh, discovering it. Yeah, so uh, I got, I was lucky enough to get in early, throw some money at it. And what was a little money then eventually became, uh, you know, a lot more money over time. Yeah. So, and so you went down the rabbit hole and I, I know uh, just from, from some of our, I'd say you probably lean libertarian. Is that a fair statement? Is oh that, gosh. I've kind of had a journey. My heart is libertarian. Um, I've since had a bit of a uh, disillusionment with libertarianism. I just don't think that libertarianism accounts for human nature. I think humans evolved to be in very hierarchical um, structures, and I don't think they function particularly well when we don't have formal hierarchies. And I think part of the problem with the sickness of modern culture is that um, hierarchies are denied, subverted – uh, rather than uh, honored and respected. And I think that's causing a lot of the anxiety, stress, depression that we have. Our, our systems just aren't made for that environment. So yeah, my heart's very libertarian. My mind at this point is like, uh, I don't think libertarianism is, at least as it's promoted by many, is workable. I just don't think it functions well. But I do like this, the, the cypherpunk approach to libertarianism. I do like the idea of developing tech that is decentralized and therefore that enables individuals to uh, make individual decisions and prevents or makes more difficult any sort of top-down centralized planning. And Bitcoin certainly does that. Gotcha. And obviously, uh, so, you know, back in 11 and 12, I mean, the national debt was already getting out of control. Um, you know, we were a couple of years post financial crisis and, uh, you know, we're 50, 60 years after Bretton Woods at that point. So, you know, what, what, uh, just if, if you can think back to then, you know, what else I, I thought of the libertarianism as part of it, but what, what else sort of contributed to the rabbit hole and, and, and really gotcha. Cause at that point, yeah. I mean, you were already, I imagine doing pretty well financially. It wasn't, uh, you know, a couple thousand bucks wasn't that big of a deal, but it was, you know, turned into a life-changing thing. And, uh, yeah, kind of curious, uh, yeah. and, and think about it now for some, from somebody's perspective who maybe hasn't even gotten it at all yet. And is like, ah, did I miss the boat or not? It'd just be, uh, you know, kind of curious to get your perspective, you know, then, but also as it's, you know, morphed now. Yeah. I think the people who don't get Bitcoin, the people who are strong critics of it just don't understand what it is. I think they've heard what it is on CNBC and they've heard other people talk about it as money or stuff like that. And um, it, it might eventually grow into that. In fact, I think it probably will. Um, but that's not the brilliance of it. That's not what it is. Um, what Bitcoin is, is a way, a novel way, the first of its kind way of achieving consensus among people who don't even, may not even know each other, 
or if they do know each other, may not even like and trust each other about the state of a network. About, for example, who owns what. In the past, because we did not have any decentralized way of achieving consensus, we had to rely on the client server model. And we did this, and you know, even before computers, we, we didn't really call them client servers, we called them and different things, master slave or whatever. But um, but the client server model takes the data, who owns what, and puts it in the custody of some supposedly trusted centralized party. It could be the register of deeds at your local county clerk's office. It could be uh, your bank's records, who's keeping track of who owns how much money in each account. It could be a um, stock exchange who's keeping track of who owns, um, or a, a you know, de depository trust company who's keeping track of who owns, you know, which shares of stock. Um, the client server model has lots of benefits to it. It's very efficient, but it has some major drawbacks. One of the major drawbacks is that the more centralized you become, the more economies of scale you have, which means the more centralized you become, which means the more economies of scale you have, which means the more centralized you become. And this is why we have fewer and fewer and fewer banks. We have fewer and fewer and fewer brokerage firms. The trend is towards centralization, which means we have central points of failure, too big to fail, all of those sort of things. And then the second big problem with the client server model is that um, when you have those huge, too big to fail centralized things, they ultimately become arms of the state through regulation, through uh, legal and sometimes illegal forms of persuasion, as we learned with the Biden administration, White House attempts to censor what happens on social media during COVID, et cetera. Um, the government ends up essentially co-opting and corrupting these centralized institutions to function on its behalf. And I don't think that's good. Um, neither my libertarian heart nor my um, non-libertarian mind uh, thinks that's a very good thing. So what Bitcoin is, it's a solution to those problems. And there's some scaling challenges. There's some other challenges that we made good progress working through. But um, when you realize what it does and how it works and what it enables, I don't see how anybody doesn't um, want to be involved with it. Great. So you posted something. Um, my thought when I started, you know, looking at once Bitcoin got big in 2017, my initial thought was, ah, the Fed's going to shut this down. This is like a danger to the the U.S. economy and then the dollar's dominance. But <clears throat> you posted something that uh, I thought was very insightful about, you know, why, you know, the U.S. government will probably, you know, kind of uh, champion Bitcoin in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but love for you to to share your thoughts on on kind of the government and you know, how they're maybe co-opting it maybe in a way. Yeah. Well, it's very decentralized, which makes it effectively impossible to, to shut down. Um, the only way to shut it down would, would be to shut down the internet and, and really even shutting down the internet wouldn't completely shut Bitcoin network down. You can actually broadcast Bitcoin transactions over radio signals. Doesn't have, doesn't, uh, it isn't, necessarily in uh, uh, internet dependent technology. So it was obvious to me that if indeed Bitcoin is as decentralized as um, it's represented to be and felt strongly that it was, that governments couldn't shut it down to, to, to even significantly impact it. Governments would have to cooperate. All governments would have to cooperate essentially form a cartel that would in every country ban Bitcoin, um, impose some pretty severe penalties for it. The problem with that is, um, as with any cartel, cartels are not Nash equilibrium scenarios. They, from a game theory perspective, cartels are not stable. And the reason is that it eventually circumstances develop in which it's in at least one party's best interest to cheat on the cartel. We see this with OPEC and oil. We see this in other areas. And then because everybody knows that it's in everybody's interest to cheat or eventually will be. And then once people start cheating, they have a massively unfair advantage once you cheat on the cartel 
over everybody who remains loyal to the cartel. And so it, it, it's not a stable scenario. Eventually it becomes a race to the exits and the cartel falls apart and really doesn't do what it's promised to do. You know, OPEC has been around for a lot of years, but it doesn't really control the price of oil anymore. They've, they've tried and tried and tried and they just can't get the cartel to hold together because Mexico cheats or Saudi Arabia cheats or whoever, you know, blows through their quotas because it's in their selfish best interest to do that. Bitcoin's the same way. You know, right now we're seeing Russia, who was in China, frankly, who were both initially hostile toward Bitcoin, embrace it. Russia's wanting to use Bitcoin because, you know, they've been locked out of the uh, the, the financial system due to sanctions. And the, flying gold back and forth from India is is not incredibly practical, which is a way they've been settling some of their transactions of late. Uh, trying to use other fiat currencies, but there's problems with those too. Trying to stand up their own separate um, uh, transaction system, separate from SWIFT and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and all of those just aren't particularly workable. So even if somebody wanted to ban Bitcoin, even if the U.S. government wanted to do it, even states within the U.S. would begin to resist it. And we're already seeing that. We've seen multiple states pass legislation that is protective of Bitcoin, protective of the right to mine, protective of the right to self-custody. Um, and there's just no game theoretical stable way of, of – of banning Bitcoin at the end of the day, it's going to continue to grow. And the game theory suggests strongly that um, it's basically going to eat, eat a lot of the world. Great. <clears throat> and, you know, how do you think that's going to affect the U S as, as the reserve currency? I think this was you, but I thought, you know, there is a thesis that it's, you know, kind of rather than another country taking over the reserve currency, it could be a real advantage to have something, have it more like a Bitcoin and, you know, less, you know, another rival government. This is where the game theory comes in again. Um, First of all, currently, I think the U.S. is the first or second biggest holder of Bitcoin, <laughs> thanks to coins they managed to uh, to uh, confiscate from Ross Ulbricht and the Silk Road founder and some others. How they managed to do that's a really interesting story, because um, normally Bitcoin is unconfiscatable, but the way they went about it and, and managed to pull it off is interesting. Um, you know. Russia doesn't want the U.S. to be the reserve currency anymore. China doesn't want the U.S. to be the reserve currency anymore. India doesn't want the U.S. to be the reserve currency anymore. And everybody who doesn't control the the reserve currency doesn't want to use other people's money as the reserve currency. There's massive disadvantages to it, including that the country that controls the world currency gets to export a large part of its inflation. So the U.S. has been able to print money now for decades. Um, and, and, and otherwise be irresponsible fiscally and monetarily and export for a long time the, the adverse consequences of that to the third world and to developing nations and, and uh, even some other developed nations. So ultimately, every world currency collapses. The average lifespan of a world reserve currency is about 100 years. Um, the U.S. is – so you, if you go back to Bretton Woods, we are, uh, you know, approaching that date, the hundred year mark. Now, some last a little longer, some last a little less, but not much longer than a hundred years. And every time that's happened, it's been another fiat currency that takes over. Um, you know, at one point, the Spanish currency was the world reserve currency. At one point, the Dutch currency was, the British pound was, the U.S. dollar is today. If... The, and when, actually, the U.S. dollar no longer functions as the world reserve currency, it's going to be in everyone's best interest to support a neutral asset. The U.S. certainly is not going to want China to have the world reserve currency, and it's going to do everything in its power to prevent that. It's not going to want India to have it. It's not going to want Russia to have it. And those countries aren't going to want anyone else but them to have it. So what you need is a neutral asset that isn't fiat that no country can control that can serve as the world reserve currency. That can be gold. There are a lot of problems with gold. Um, a lot of people call Bitcoin somewhat rightfully, I, th I think, gold 2.0 uh, because it has all of the advantages of gold and essentially none of the disadvantages of gold. And I'd love to debate Peter Schiff on that someday. Um, and so, yeah, when you look around, like what's an asset that the world can agree on that we can all 
say, yes, we're going to use this to settle our international transactions with, and the U.S. can't control it, and China can't control it, and Russia can't control it. It's, it's one thing that even enemies can agree on because nobody has control over it. Uh, countries that have lower energy costs may have an advantage than some other countries do, but they can't control it like they can fiat and just print money and export the inflation. So uh, I do think that Bitcoin is well on its way and will eventually become um, a res world reserve currency, if not the primary world reserve currency. Yeah, there, there's tipping points of adoption, and I forget the exact amounts, and actually I forget the name of the the thing, whether it's like once it's at five or 10%, but I think you've uh, mentioned that in the mm. past as well. Maybe talk to that for a second. Yeah. So, you know, when you have exponential adoption and Bitcoin's actually uh, on a, a power law um, rather than an, an exponential, um, which is similar, but slightly different. But when you have these exponential adoption curves of any tech, you know, you think in terms of doublings. Uh, you know, the famous example is the, the Chinese emperor who, um, I forget the, the the full story, but basically he was he had he had a uh, a bet with one of the people in his in his court, and the idea was you know if you take one grain of rice and put it on each square and put it on the first square of a chessboard, and then the second square you put two, third square you put four. By the time you get all the squares covered, you you there's not enough rice in the world. <laughs> so just that number of doublings, that's how quickly things get out of control. And yeah, sort so of how, once you get to yeah. 1% adoption on something, this is the interesting thing. Once you get to 1% adoption of anything that's an exponential adoption curve, you're only seven doublings away from 100%. And we are in the US well above 1% adoption on Bitcoin at this point. Um, I've heard different numbers for most of the world, but I think it, most people would agree that even in the world we're we're above one percent now. So we're only seven doublings away from essentially the saturation point where pretty much everybody has it. Yeah. And the rate of adoption, the rate of the doublings is is uh, getting slightly slower over time rather than a true exponential, which would maintain the the doublings at the same rate, like Moore's laws, you know, computer power doubles every two years or whatever or one year. Um, so it is slowing down a little bit, but it's not, it's not slowing up much and it's not ceasing. So yeah, exactly. We, I, I expect that it's slowly then suddenly, and we're quickly approaching the knee of the curve when it's going to be sudden rapid adoption by nation states and others, you know, Trump has now come out and said that, uh, if he's elected, he's going to set up a U.S. Bitcoin reserve. If the U.S. does that. Every country is going to be forced to do that. Every central bank is going to be forced by game theory to do that. Even if the U.S. doesn't do it, some other country will. And, um, uh, you know, El Salvador has already done that to a limited degree. And then others will be eventually be forced to follow suit. The game theory of Bitcoin is the thing. So few people understand it. And it all but assures ultimate dominance in my mind. Yeah, I, I think especially more so that the U.S. is pivoting on interest rates. It's been a tough couple of years, especially for uh, you know, I do a lot of commercial real estate, and uh, you know the, the the Fed rate going from zero to five has squeezed a lot of people, and I, I'm I'm seeing it in the real economy. I think a lot of the COVID money that was printed has sort of been spent and sucked up by inflation at this point, and you know whether whether or not we're in a formal recession or not, it's uh, you know I could I could just see that things are are tighter right now. Yeah. Um, you know, neither of us have a crystal ball, but, uh, you know, what do you see over the next, uh, few years in, in, you know, in the economy and especially with, uh, it seems like they're folding on inflation right now. They're, you know, it's not quite to 2%, but, uh, you know, they're going to be cutting rates over the next year yeah. or two. And, uh, they absolutely have no choice. Uh, well, they do have a choice. The, the, the government does have a choice, but the other choice would be absolutely disastrous. Basically the U S debt is now so big and world debt is now so big that, it is unsustainable and you can't raise taxes enough at this point to pay down the debt or to even keep it from growing further because raising tax rates a lot will slow growth, which ultimately lowers tax revenue. Um, we're at this tipping point where uh, the, the Fed is faced with either being responsible with regard to inflation and keeping inflation under control and bankrupting 
the U.S. government after first bankrupting lots and lots of foreign governments because they would all go bankrupt before the U.S. would. Uh, or continuing to print money despite the fact that we're at near peaks in the U.S. stock market, despite the fact that we're just coming out on the tail end of inflation and haven't gotten down to the 2% target that's yet, despite the fact, uh, all the other facts you want to throw out there. And so you have to bet, ultimately, is the Fed going to be disciplined and cause a, a new Great Depression worldwide that would make the original Great Depression look pale in comparison? Uh, or is it going to print money to finance the U.S. government debt and cause inflation? And I think the answer is it's definitely going to do the latter. And we're seeing that already. The Fed is is almost certainly loosening up in a time when, um, if this were the 1980s, people would say the Fed would be insane to be loosening up, loosening policy right now. But it's, it is, and it's going to, and it's going to continue. People are saying it's because of the election. That's part of it. It's not because of the election so much, though. It's mainly because we can't pay our debts without money printing. So the ultimate outcome here is the Fed is going to have to do what it did in the 1940s, um, which is it's going to have to let inflation run higher than interest rates so that we have negative real interest rates for an extended period of time. We're talking a decade or so. Um, if you do that enough, the denominator GDP is inflating uh, more quickly than the numerator is inflating. And so your debt to GDP ratio gets inflated away um, as a result. So that's going to be the game plan. I'm absolutely convinced we're going to have moderate to high inflation over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it's either that or a Great Depression. And I, I don't think the Fed is going to intentionally cause a Great Depression. Yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And frankly, they may just fudge the numbers. I mean, if you look at shadow stats, the, the real inflation is a lot higher than the 2 and 3% right now if you exactly. just track it the way they tracked it in the 80s. Yeah. You know, back at the peak, if you tracked it the way uh, the peak inflation just a year or two ago, a couple of years ago now, I guess it was. Um, yeah, if you went to shadow stats and you measured it the same way they were measured in the 1980s when people were freaking out about inflation and Paul Volcker famously came in and drove interest rates up to 25% and crushed inflation and crushed the economy too, which you could do back then because we didn't have this massive debt overhang. If you tried that today, you'd bankrupt everybody, including the U.S. government. Do you recall what the number was for shadow stats? You know, if it was oh, yeah. RP, yeah. Nine or 10. So it, we, we actually had the highest rate of inflation in U.S. history at that point in time, uh, or modern U.S. history, at least at that point in time. It was higher even than during the 1980s. And I believe the number I recall seeing was in the low 20s. You know, the government was reporting that we're running seven, eight percent inflation, and we were actually running by measuring it the same way we did in the eighties, running in the in the low to mid twenties. Yeah, and, and we I've I've seen it. We saw it with rent prices. We saw it even even the Big Mac index. Uh, you know, even like you know, 20, 25 years ago, you can get a I think a value meal for three dollars or three fifty. Yeah, and uh, you know now it's like you can't get out of McDonald's for less than ten bucks. I could use to eat a little less McDonald's, honestly, but. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I order, a, you know, I order a, a large, the other day I ordered a large pizza. It's like 29 bucks for one large pizza, you know, three toppings. It wasn't like I threw every topping on it or anything. It's wild. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real. And it's definitely, it's definitely hurting the middle class for sure. Mm. Yeah, we, we've seen that affordability is really, really at, at its limits right now. Seen that on, on. Housing, housing and uh, yeah. and on top of that, there's a there's still a shortage of housing. You know, there's certain markets that have perhaps overbuilt. You know, Dallas, Phoenix, some of the Sun Belts. There's a lot of new apartments on, but the single family market. Um, so many people locked in at three percent, two and a half percent, or just don't have mortgages that it's completely locked out. You know, perhaps a whole generation of of homeowners from finding an affordable house at this point. Yeah. Well, this is you know, I, I saw a study just came out in the last. Two or three days. I don't know if you saw this, but it was a it was a headline in something. I wish I could remember where I, where I saw it and what who published it. But it was a study done, show indicating and apparently demonstrating that there's actually not a shortage of housing. There's a shortage of affordable housing, um, which is a little different. Um, there's enough housing units to house everybody, but there's not enough affordable housing. And I think the reason for that is that 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 we, because of fiat money, because of inflation, because the Fed um, undermines the currency as a store of value over the long term, um, 
people are turning to other assets and have had to turn to other assets for 40, 50, 60 years now, stocks, bonds, and real estate primarily to, um, to be stores of value because they can't store value reliably over decades in, in savings. Intentionally, the Fed makes it so that they can't. Um, and so because of that, we have bid up the price of everything. PE multiples and stocks are ridiculously high compared to 1940s through 1970s standards. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the price to rent you know, ratio in real estate is crazy high compared to what it has historically been. Uh, bond yields have been, until very recently, crazy low, um, insanely low, negative in some instances, um, kind of an historical anomaly in that regard. All of those are indications that we have one huge, giant bubble, the, the everything bubble. And uh, ultimately, that bubble is going to get pricked. Um, and I happen to think that Bitcoin is going to be uh, play a big role in pricking that bubble and, and bursting that bubble. Um, and, and when it does, I think we're going to see PE multiples drop dramatically. We're going to see bond interest rates rise dramatically. We're going to see uh, real estate values uh, fall pretty dramatically as well. That's all for this episode of Alternative Investor Mastermind. Now that you know the many alternative opportunities out there all up for the taking, you can finally become ultra-connected and ultra-wealthy. Get more valuable advice from the experts by subscribing to the show at alternativeinvestormastermind.com. Become a winner in the world of passive investing today in alternative investment strategies. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.